Wyoming in the Department of Geology and Geophysics, but Ryan is a paleoecologist, paleoclimatologist uh, in the department, so he's kind of a guy who works at the surface. Um, and I've known Brian for a long time uh, at various interactions. He did a postdoc in Oregon and then he went to the University of Minnesota where he was in the geography department on the faculty there. And then he went to the University of Wyoming in 2007. So thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks for having me, Kathleen. Thank you for everyone for coming. And I really appreciate the chance to come up here. Uh, you know, I've been through this area before, but I've never really been to campus and seen all the exciting things going on. So I, uh, th th this talk I'm going to give is sort of set up to focus on some of my paleoecological interests. And uh, mostly I'm going to be talking about fossil pollen and charcoal records, climate records that come from small lakes like this one shown here, which is a lake uh, in, in um, north central Wyoming in the Wind River Range. Uh, but, uh, but I'll be showing you data from a number of different locations. And, and this really represents work that's been supported by a number of different grants, so I really appreciate that opportunity. The, uh, the, the big driving point that I wanted to get at here today is that uh, I, I've been looking around at the landscapes and how much they've been changing recently. This is a photo from the Bighorn Mountains, and here you see uh, just all these dead trees from the recent mountain pine beetle outbreak. And of course, the question in my mind is, what, what's going to happen to that in the future? Are we going to just regrow the same forest? Will they shift to something totally new? And, and I've been fascinated by the idea that the paleoecological data support, which is that we can have big shifts in what an ecosystem is, uh, what type of vegetation you have at one time, can suddenly become something totally different. Mm. And we can see this in some places today, uh, this is really close to, uh, to my home down in Laramie, Wyoming. This is in the Snowy Range in southern Wyoming. And it's this high alpine meadow right up at tree line today. Uh, there's almost no tree regeneration going on there. But the landscape of this meadow, which is almost a square mile in size, is covered with these snags that, are, um, that date to the early 1800s. So these were, this was once a forest. Uh, if you look at this landscape, you can see uh, off in the distance some big snags standing there, trees lying, these um, logs lying across the landscape. And yet the, the nearest trees that are quite old, actually, are all very small um, and very young. So, so this had been a very different type of subalpine forest, and something caused the transition um, to this much more open state. And so I, I, this idea that you could have one system and shift suddenly to something totally different uh, has been in my mind. And, and so I, I've been thinking about two kind of general ways in which this could happen. Uh, and this is uh, from a paper we had in uh, Journal of Ecology a couple years ago that sort of laid out two M-member models. And on one hand, if you look over on the left side of the, of the graph here, on the top we plotted kind of a climate history. And at the bottom we're plotting uh, vegetation in a couple different locations. Each line would represent a different location. And this is just a cartoon to make the point that you could see abrupt shifts in what type of vegetation you have in a given place if the climate suddenly changes abruptly. That might trigger uh, a transition to a totally new ecosystem. On the other hand, if climate is sort of gradually changing and you had something like a fire suddenly uh, burn that landscape and change it, but the conditions afterwards are slightly different, but not abruptly different from what they were before. You may also trigger a new shift without necessarily the climate shifting abruptly. This would be a more of an internal or intrinsic change in the ecosystem. So in this case, if you look on the lower right there, uh, we're looking at lines that represent different places on this landscape, and they're all shifting at different times because they're triggered maybe by fires or wind throw or um, some other disturbance to that ecosystem at different times, but the growing conditions after each change is totally different than before, so you end up shifting that state permanently. So what I'm gonna to try to do um, today is look at some fossil records that uh, give examples, I think, of two, these two extremes. Um, one example that's pretty heavily tied to climate, and another example where there is a climate involvement, but probably factors like fires play a big role. <clears throat> 
Um, so mostly what I'll be talking about are these core sediment cores that we've collected from lakes, like Kathy's group has done here. Uh, you can, if you look at the image of the core here, you can see layers of charcoal or the dark bands in those cores. Um, this is one of the lakes that I'll talk about down in northern Colorado. And then, and of course, we'll also use fossil pollen from those sediment cores um, to look at the vegetation composition through time. So the two cases also get a, uh, an element here of scale being an important factor. If you think about different landscape scales, all the way from the size of, say, one watershed on the left here to a landscape made of multiple watersheds up to, say, an a entire mountain range and then up to an entire region, uh, you can imagine how the relative importance of factors like a single fire or a single disturbance could be very different at the scale of a single watershed where you could burn the whole thing at once or you know, in one event. Whereas at the scale of the whole region, it would be unlikely, even if you have a lot of synchronized fires, you're unlikely to burn that entire region. Now, we know there are disturbances that can play out on that scale. The mountain pine beetle outbreak over the last decade is a good example of that. But on the other hand, climate is something that might be more important at that larger scale. So the example I'm going to start with focuses at this larger regional scale, and I'm going to make uh, kind of test the hypothesis that climate is an important driver there. And then later I'll come back to something that's uh, much finer in spatial scale to focus on uh, liberal disturbance. So this first example is the history, the Holocene, the last 11,000 years of Eastern Hemlock. So this is um, Suga canadensis, which grows uh, from across the Appalachians up into New England and then out to the Great Lakes region. It's this um, important conifer that you can see here uh, in this photo from a forest in central Massachusetts. Uh, and, and it's an important tree species uh, for the eastern deciduous forests. It is currently um, declining because of the hemlock woolly adelgid, which is an insect that's been attacking it. But, um, but it has a really interesting and dynamic history over the last 11,000 years. So to um, give you a sense of this, what I'm going to show you are some maps that start us back during the last ice age, 15,000 years ago. And each, anim each frame in this animation I'll show it is a step forward 1,000 years in time. And so if we go back 15,000 years ago, this is North America, you see the large ice sheet covering everything. Where it's gray, we have data from fossil pollen data as to what the vegetation was. And where it's white, there's, there's not data represented in this animation. But the different shades of green that you'll see represent the amount of hemlock pollen uh, in, in the various uh, samples that are represented by the maps. There's the western hemlock species that you'll see over in the Pacific Northwest there. I'm not going to focus on those. Um, this story is really about the eastern species, which 15,000 years ago are essentially not found in the record as we have it. But starting about 14,000 years ago, hemlock shows up in the Smoky Mountains, the Southern Appalachians. And over the next few thousand years, it increases in abundance and gradually moves its way northward along the Appalachians up into New England. And as the, as the world is warming here, it's migrating northward. And then it also begins to spread out in the northeast, out towards the Midwest. But here's the and here's the big change that happens. 6,000 years ago, it's this really important, very abundant tree. And then rapidly, its abundance just declines across its entire range. And it stays low for a couple thousand years. And then it comes back and it recovers. It recovers its former abundance until Europeans come on and cut it all down. Um, so that this decline, though, back 5,000 years ago, is almost as dramatic as Europeans showing up and cutting these trees down. So, um, so my question, and this is kind of a classic problem in paleoecology, is what, what happened? Why did that, what played out there? And here, uh, just to give you a picture of this through time, here's 15,000 years ago to present across the bottom. The, each green line you see here is the percent hemlock pollen per, uh, abundance at a number of different lakes in New England. And the black line is the average of all of them. You can see this really abrupt decline about 5,500 years ago. And then this long period where it stays low and then it recovers. And so the question is, what is that? And uh, one obvious uh, hypothesis is that it's something like a disease or an insect outbreak that really wiped it out. And that there's a lot of uh, that was a really nicely articulated hypothesis, and so it's one that's been around for a long time. Uh, the argument that I've 
uh, been interested in is whether or not it's actually maybe climate that's playing a role. And so um, what we're going to pursue here now is looking at the possibility that climate is, is an important factor in this. So here's some of the problems with it as a disease. If we look up at the top, um, these graphs up here at the top, each individual line is a different lake, one in Vermont, um, one in Massachusetts, and two in New York. Uh, the lines show the same cha relative changes in abundance through time, but if you look carefully at the time when the decline occurs, it's not synchronous. Um, sometimes in places that are close together, it's up to 1,500 years different in time when this abrupt change happens. And so, oh, I don't know what I do about that. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Thanks. All right. Um, so, so this is a problem if it's a disease or an insect outbreak sweeping across the landscape. Why would it um, have impacted some places so much later? Uh, whereas we know things like the chestnut um, blight that wiped out American chestnut, that spread across this whole same region in decades. Um, so, so that's a challenge. Now, I've argued in the past that maybe something like a drought was involved, and what's shown at the bottom here are two reconstructions I've made of precipitation over the last 12,000 years based on the water levels of lakes. So I've estimated the volumes of lakes in this region through time, calculated from that the balance of precipitation that would have changed. And if you look carefully, there's two lines. One is blue and one is gray. They're from eastern and western Massachusetts. And there are droughts that punctuate that kind of long-term trend that happen about the time of the decline. The problem with them is they're A, not at the same time, and B, they are they make it drier, but they don't actually make it as dry as it was when hemlock first shows up. And so then why would that be a good trigger? So, so there's both challenges to the disease hypothesis and to the kind of climate hypothesis as a new system. Now, here's another catch though to the disease hypothesis, and something I've noticed recently is over here on the right is the, are the maps of hemlock again. So on the left is elm, so a, a temperate deciduous tree, totally different ecologically, um, and grow, lives much more abundantly in the Midwest. But if we look at its abundance through time, starting here 8,000 years ago, watch the two species, they both do well 7,000 years ago, 6,000 years ago, but then they actually both their line. Um, about 5,000 years ago and stay low. Now, the, so that suggests to me that maybe this isn't as simple as something species specific, but something that's affecting very different ecological uh, organisms on, on this, in this region, which climate could be a better explanation for. So to help us think about the role of climate, uh, one of the things I've been focused on is the climate niche occupied by hemlock. So this is where do we find hemlock growing? Where do we get lots of pollen from hemlock trees um, today relative to climate? And so up at the top left here, what we have is a map of a graph showing the percentage of hemlock in modern samples all over Eastern North America relative to temperature. You can see there's kind of a, a mode there from about 18 to 20 degrees where it's most abundant. Um, on the lower right, what I plotted is uh, the same data but versus precipitation. And I tilted the axis there so that uh, percentage hemlock is across the x-axis and per uh, precipitation is on the y, because then I project both of those two plots onto this by plot space um, in the lower left, where it's precip versus July temperature, and the size of the bubble represents the amount of hemlock pollen. Um, and so the interesting thing, though, if we look at the precip, is that if you look at it, it's actually bimodal. There's a mode at about 1,100 millimeters of precipitation, and then another even higher one down at about 775. And there's, there's actually a trough in between those. Um, when we plot that onto that bimodal space, it turns out that there's kind of two parallel ridges um, of abundance. And there actually are, if you look carefully, you'll see that there's smaller dots separating the ones I've highlighted in black from the ones I've highlighted in, in green. And if we take a slice through this along that diagonal line, it looks like this. And so you can see that there's this bimodality to its distribution. It prefers to be slightly drier than its average and slightly cooler than its average, and it prefers to be slightly warmer or wetter, but not right at the average. Um, and the other thing about this that's really interesting is each of those modes has this negative relationship between where it occurs with precip versus temperature. 
So, if, so it tends to do well along these bands where if, as it gets colder, it also gets wetter, um, which I'm going to come back to because that will be important. <coughs> so, this is, so looking at this modern um, relationship with climate, I thought might be useful for thinking about the past. So, um, so then the question was, well, how did the climate change and how does that relate to this history? Um, so we've gone out to lots of lakes, collected sediment cores, used geophysics to do things like measure the water level of the lakes through time, uh, reconstruct temperatures. And uh, tomorrow I'm going to talk in the Earth Science Department that will go into more depth on how we do that. But today the important point is that here are two variables that we've been able to put together over the last 12,000 years. The top is temperature and the bottom is effective precipitation. Um, the bottom is the average of two different lake level reconstructions that we've done uh, on, in coastal Massachusetts, and they're highly correlated with each other. Uh, they suggest that precipitation has increased by something about 500 millimeters um, over this time frame. Uh, at the top, what we have are two different estimates of temperature. One actually comes from the fossil pollen data itself, that's the black line. I'm not going to really <coughs> focus on that, except to point out here that it is in close agreement with the geochemical estimate, um, uh, which is listed there, in, shown in red, which comes from this approach using alkanones, which are an organic compound we find in the sediments. Um, if you look even at the details, in, especially in the last few thousand years, you can see the two lines are pretty highly correlated with each other. So um, for the purposes of this talk, I'm really going to only focus on the red line, which is totally independent of the pollen data to get our temperature history. But this allows us to have both temperature and moisture constraint in the past. You can see that about eight to 6,000 years ago, temperatures were maybe about a half degree warmer than the 20th century. And that about nine to 10,000 years ago, there was about half degree cooler than the 20th century. So to help you think about what do those climate changes mean, what I've done here is I've plotted, I've taken those two data sets and representing this square that's in central Massachusetts right there on the East Coast, um, what I've done is say if we had those differences from the modern climate of that place in New England today, where would we today find that same climate? And so this is each dot on this graph is the median location today where you'd have that combination of temperature and moisture. And so it actually starts off in the upper left there and uh, the and it comes forward over to the right. So originally, when it was cooler and drier, it was like being in Manitoba, and then it became like being in Minnesota and then Wisconsin and Michigan, and then it moved to Western New York before eventually we end up in New England. And so, if you think about a species tracking its optimal climates, if it had been growing in New England twelve thousand years ago, today, if it had followed its climate all the way perfectly it would today end up growing in Manitoba. Um, and so this is, so mostly what you see here is that um, we, we've climatically crossed multiple biomes here. So it's not surprising we might have seen some important ecological changes. Now I'm gonna come back to this plot of where hemlock occupies um, climate space. And I wanna point out something interesting about that negative relationship here between temperature and precipitation. And that is, if we start off at some point that's a little bit too cold and too dry um, for hemlock to grow, we can, we can increase hemlock abundance both by either going to the right on this graph by making it warmer, or by going up vertically on the graph by making it wetter. So hemlock's abundance could be sensitive to either variable pretty equally. And to think about that, to help us look at how these effects might play out, what I'm going to do here is, um, at the top, here's one of our lakes records, this one's from Vermont. 12,000 years ago to present, you can see the variations in its abundance through time, the big crash in the mid-Holocene. But plot at the bottom are the temperature reconstruction in red and the moisture reconstruction in blue. And if you think about where, if we start from some starting point, it's the positive deviations from that starting point that would move us into the space occupied by hemlock or back out of it. And so by taking the sum of the positive anomalies from this dashed line here, we actually make a really simple first order model, that's the orange line here, um, that this is simply, a, this is not a regression, I'm not trying to fit the data to the pollen data, I'm just saying 
what's the sum if we start from some point and move either towards more moisture or, or warmer conditions, um, what's the sum of those two changes? And this orange line is what we see. And so what this predicts is that the abundance of hemlock early on is favored by it becoming warmer. That moves us to the right on that other graph. But then when it suddenly cooled off by about a degree 5,500 years ago, it then moved back out of that space of optimal framework. But then as it became wetter since then, it moved back into that space. And so we recover. And uh, here's the plot, the same plot with climate space again, but the orange line is where we were climatically through time. The bold part of that line is that cooling event where we suddenly cool back off, moving to the left on the graph. And so we're moving out of the space occupied by hemlock. And then as things get uh, wetter, we then move vertically upwards on us. Um, so, the, so the climate trajectory through here is consistent with why we might expect to see a decline. Um, a different way of looking at this is, again, looking at that vertically. So this is the, the, that bimodality that we could see if we kind of plot projected everything onto that slice across the climate space. The gray dots are the modern samples. The brown dots are one of the fossil records plotted in climate space. Um, and you can see that it stays within the same distribution as the modern data. And the, the, the brown dots to the left are the ones from the early Holocene. They then go down into the trough between modes, and then the ones on the right are from the later part of the Holocene. Um, and so it kind of goes up and down between these two, these two modes. And we see this at multiple sites, the same type of staying within the modern distribution, um, but uh, tracking it by modality. Uh, to give us one last, more quantitative test of this, we built some generalized additive models or GAMs um, that are we're essentially using like a regression. The problem with normal linear regression is that we have this bimodal distribution. So if we fit a straight line to it, we're not going to do very well. So generalized additive models are approach that let us fit a number of smaller uh, polynomials to the shape of the data and get a better fit and then make predictions based on that. Um, so we've done this for a number of sites, and the, uh, these are two of our records in Massachusetts. The green is actual data, the black and gray lines are two different um, models that we made um, to predict it. You can see the scatter plots show the, the observed versus the predicted values. Uh, the percentages listed there are the root mean squared error, so how, how close are we to fitting the data? Um, and in general, these models do a good job of capturing the overall pattern. We built the model use including these sites, uh, but then we actually predicted some additional sites that were not included in the model and uh, still actually did pretty well at capturing the major patterns here. Um, and so it, it seems to suggest that this decline in the policy uh, is not necessarily something that requires an additional agent like fire or disease. Those are probably involved. I mean, you need things like that to actually build the trees. But, um, but climate really could have been a strong force um, in making this happen. So in this case, this really fits kind of our first model here of we see an abrupt change in the ecosystem, but it's really because of an abrupt change in the climate system. So that works on this broad regional scale. Um, what I'm going to do now is give you a totally different example. We're going to zoom in to the finer spatial scale where a disturbance like a fire could play a much bigger role. And this is work that we're doing. This is work of my uh, recent PhD student, John Calder. He's been working down in Colorado in these forests that you see photo, uh, pictured here. These are uh, ribbon forests, which are interesting. They're high um, subalpine systems that have these linear bands of meadow separated by linear forests. And uh, um, we thought this would be an interesting case uh, ecosystem to work in because there's a key feedback involved in creating this structure. And that is, if you look at this uh, view from Google Earth, this is the Mount Zirkel Wilderness um, down there. Uh, if you look at the bands here of forests, uh, they're separated by those bands of meadow. But the reason they're there, if I zoom in, is because even well into the summer, snowdrifts linger in those meadows. The trees essentially act as snow drifts. You get big drifts behind them. Then those, it takes a long time for those drifts to melt out, and that prevents trees from growing. But if you had, say, a fire, 
and burned off the trees, you'd change the drifting patterns. Or if you had a change in snow cover, like a drought where there's very little snow, you might, if that's sustained for some period of time, you may allow trees to recruit in those meadows in between. So there's reasons to think that this type of system could be shifted. And uh, we kind of came up with this simple conceptual model for it. We made a little simulation here. And this is random, this is this is a random number series at the top, um, which we're pretending is temperature. And it's following a trend, but then it wiggles around that trend. But you can imagine that if for trees living on a landscape, there might be a point in which uh, the climate trend would get below the point at which it can regenerate. Maybe it's too cold, or maybe there's too much of that snow drifting, and so the trees can't regenerate. So, but the uh, mature trees in the landscape could still survive <coughs> maybe down to this lower dash line. So the interesting thing about that is, if you look at the bottom and simulate the consequences of that, the gray line is what happens if you have no disturbances, you're just generally tracking climate, and towards the end you stop recruiting, you stop regenerating. Um, so it fades away. But if you have fires superimposed on that, while it's still warm or not very snowy, you can have a fire and then succession will allow your trees to recover. But later on, if you have a fire and it's too cold or it's too snowy, you can't recover from it, and so you go through the state shift. So the question was, do we see this type of thing playing out um, in some actual records? And we're going to focus on the last 2,000 years because it's a time period that we could sample um, densely enough to really look at this, but there are also some meaningful climate changes. So at the top here are the temperature reconstructions in red for the whole northern hemisphere, um, and black is for just North America. Um, and then the blue line below that is actually a record from Colorado near our study area. It's an oxygen isotope measurement where the higher values are either warmer or less snow. We, don't, we actually don't know which one it is. Um, and then at the bottom, these are some additional measurements from our cores, but just to point out that some of the same features you can track across multiple sites across this landscape. But basically about a thousand years ago, there's a slightly warmer period that may have also been drier. And then we've trended into what people call the little ice age of the last few centuries where it was cooler and possibly snowier. <clears throat> And so this is kind of the climate background in which we decided to analyze how these woodland forests um, changed. Now, the question was, what about disturbances? So what we thought would be most important here is not just if we have one small fire in the landscape, but do you have big fires that burn large portions of that landscape? Um, because the pollen records that we're going to use to get at the vegetation history, they pollen is blowing all over the place, right? So we're sampling a big part of the landscape. <coughs> so we need to have burned a big part of the landscape to really change the pollen that's going to make it into our lake. So the first thing that John did was to go out and look for evidence that there were big fire events that covered large portions of the landscape. And to do this, he went to the Mount Zirkel Wilderness and he sampled uh, 12 different lakes and counted the amount of charcoal in each centimeter, <coughs> each centimeter of those cores over the last 2,000 years. And then use that to put together a percent of the sites burned per century. This is what the raw data look like, um, or not totally raw data, but converted to the flux of charcoal through time. So this is each graph here is 2,500 2, years. The vertical lines show you the amount of charcoal per centimeter of core <laughs> per unit time. And uh, using the method that um, Kathy's group has long used and, and developed, um, we separated kind of the low back <coughs> of the map, the kind of smooth trends in the data here, from the peaks, with the idea that the peaks themselves were the real fire events. And so we've sort of flagged those with the pluses across the top. But what John then did was take the ages of each of those fires, and there's some uncertainty here because we don't really know exactly how far in the past it was. We're basing it on radiocarbon estimates that have some uncertainty around them. So what he did was he built then a probabilistic model that included that uncertainty to estimate what's the likelihood that a certain percentage of sites burned at any given time. And, and this is the trend over the last 2,000 years. Uh, you see most of the time, it seems like on average, maybe something about 40% of that landscape burned per century. But about um, 1,100 years ago, there was a time period where maybe something like 80% of that landscape burned um, in, in 100 or 200 years. What's interesting about that is that that coincides with the start of this warmer interval about a thousand years ago, the medieval 
climate anomaly, MCA, this, this warm or medieval time. And, uh, and so, so here we have both the climate change and a big disturbance event. And fitting with the model I talked about before, as it cools off after that, did that the question for us was, did that affect regeneration or the, the vegetation pattern on this landscape? So uh, here's one of John's sites, and we had the question, like, how did these ribbon forests around these lakes respond to both that, that interaction between climate and fire? So here uh, is just some example of the type of data we're working with. Here's a spruce pollen grain up there at the top to give you a sense of what John spent his time counting. Um, here's all the percentages on the top of the, the amount of spruce in the pollen record. At the bottom is the amount of artemisia or sagebrush pollen. And you can generally see that there's a trade-off. Um, there was more spruce in the past, less now. Um, there was less sagebrush in the past and more now. The dashed lines show how the means change and where there's uh, potentially meaningful regime shifts. If we look at this another way, um, what we look up at, at the top, the bottom, bottom of the same two graphs I just showed you, at the top is an index of how similar was all the pollen in each sample to the modern samples from the modern um, ribbon forest around this lake. And if you start back, in this case, about 3,000 years ago, it, it's a relative index, so there was, it was much less similar. It was, it was not like the modern, it was significantly different from the modern vegetation or the modern pollen um, making it into this lake. And it stayed pretty significantly different until about 1,000 years ago, when you can see it suddenly shifts. And then it becomes much more consistently like the modern ribbon forest. And this, the second graph from the top here is the probability that you have some real change in the assemblage of all the different species of pollen that John counted. It's not just these two he's looking at. He's looking at, you know, 30 different types. So what's the probability that that total mixture changed? And you can see there's a high probability of a shift right about a thousand years ago. Well, um, this is interesting for two reasons. First is, if we look at the general trend, you can see that, that there was no big shift in the actual percentages of tree species. It was in that index of whether it was similar to today or not. It was less pronounced than the, the individual species. So if we take the percent total conifer pollen, like how, how forest covered was this landscape, that's the black line here on the right. The blue line underneath it is that oxygen isotope record that tells us about how warm or snowy it was in the past. And then the scatter plot is the correlation between those two. Um, the line there builds in the temporal autocorrelation into the, the model uh, of regression between them. Um, but there is a significant correlation. That, that beta value there is the slope of that line, which is significantly different from zero, suggesting there is a positive relationship. And if you look at the details there, um, the, most, the maximum values for both the oxygen isotopes and the conifer pollen are at the same time. And many of the minima are are at the same time. So when it tended to be warmer or less snowy, the forest loved it, expanded. Uh, when it was uh, snowier or colder, there were fewer trees on that landscape. So at first pass, it looks like climate's a really big factor here. But here's that same set of time series on the left. The, the blue, again, is oxygen isotopes. The black is the percent conifer pollen. The graph on the right is the residuals of that relationship. So if you subtract out um, the effect of the oxygen isotopes or the climate signal from the conifers, what's left over? And what you can see is that if, you know, if, it was, if climate had explained it all really well, it would just fluctuate around zero, there would be some noise. Um, but what you see is about a thousand years ago is that the residuals shift from being positive to being negative. And essentially, you're still seeing a relationship with climate, it's just shifted. And it happens that that transition happens right when 80% of the landscape burned. Um, another way of looking at this is using that index of similarity to the modern pollen. So this is the same type of graph again, but instead of presenting the percent conifer pollen, we're now looking at the relative similarity to the modern ribbon forest. And you can see that the oxygen isotope record explains a fair amount of variability in there. But there is a deviation in the last thousand years, which you see most pronounced in the residual graph on the right, and it coincides in time again with when that maximum fire episode um, seems to have played out. So 
Uh, this is very similar to our model in the sense that climate seems to be sort of shaping a relative amount, but there is some sort of step shift that takes place um, at the time of fire as it's cooling off for, or becoming snowier, preventing uh, the trees from recovering. And essentially the way we're interpreting this is that it had actually been a closed conifer forest, but then the fires came along, opened that landscape up, snow drifting started taking place, and that became a new template onto which trees could regenerate, and they couldn't regenerate everywhere across that landscape now. And as a result, you get the ribbon forest developing only in the last thousand years after the fire. Um, and so in this case, this to me uh, is a potentially an example of this more uh, interactive type change where it's not climate totally forcing the system, climate's involved, but you actually needed that fire to come in and really cause the additional switch. And so one of the next things I'm really interested in doing, and part of the reason we're developing a new project up here in Montana, is see, we see similar types of changes, but at different times because the fires aren't at the same time everywhere. Um, so we'll, we'll see how that develops. So uh, just to kind of give you the kind of broad conclusion about all this, um, it seems like in both these cases, we have some reasonable evidence that climate has been an important factor in shaping the, the composition of forests, both in the East Coast and here in the Rockies over millennia. Um, and that, and in fact, in both cases, we find very little evidence that there's lagged responses. The climate, the vegetation, the pollen records that we see, they're pretty closely tracked with the climate records uh, do. And so uh, it suggests that we, of course, run that risk now as climate change accelerates again, uh, that we could have some pretty pronounced ecological changes. But um, that critical <coughs> transitions could also be facilitated, especially at local scales, by big disturbances like fires or the mountain pine beetle outbreak. And uh, as those become, again, also more frequent, um, that raises a lot of risks of pretty pronounced change. So um, this is one of our sites, by the way, which burned last summer. John's study area, which I was just talking about 80% of that landscape burning a thousand years ago. Last summer, we burned um, about half of it in one fire. So, wow. thanks. Yeah. Very interesting work. Uh, on the ribbon forest study, um, I think your hypothesis that fire may have trigger those uh, positive feedbacks that created the ribbon uh, forest yeah. themselves. But it seems that you could achieve the same amount of pollen yeah. through time with a variety of spatial arrangements. Yeah, so I didn't show it, but we actually, I was really curious about this exactly. And so one thing that John did was he went out and sampled modern pollen from lakes in these ribbon forests versus other sub systems, some of which are also very open, like where they have big um, parks that are kind of cold air drainage park areas. Um, and then other closed sub alpine forests and, and also tundra areas. And what he found was that the ribbon forest actually stood out um, distinctly from the rest of those groups. Um, so I was really surprised that that would be the case. And, and I agree with you though, that that is a point of caution here that um, it's not necessarily a case that it was that same configuration. On the other hand, the trees that are there today are 400 years old, and that that pattern seems to only existed for a thousand years. So, it, at least a big chunk of that probably is analogous. Um, but but that's uh, an issue if we wanted to try to take it back deeper in time. Yeah. So in the beginning of your talk, when you were talking about hemlock, yeah, uh, the dependent variable was percent of pollen that's hemlock. And yeah. so it seems like that decline could also have been the arrival of one or more new species uh, that yes, produce prodigious right. pollen. Yeah, yeah, no, really, really good point. Um, and I, of course, I didn't show you what all the other species right. are doing. Um, yeah, it, um, that is a, uh, it, it turns out that that's not the answer here. If we, if we put it in absolute terms, the amount of hemlock pollen um, and looked at it just as, you know, the influx of pollen grains per year, you see this big change. <laughs> if you go to lakes where we have actually needles of hemlocks in the sediment, you see that that, that really drops off. And it's, and it's not because something else shows up. In a lot of these cases, they, um, the dominant tree species on that landscape is oak, and it just rides it out. 
It doesn't care. And so that was one of the reasons why um, a disease was a really favored explanation was because it, at many of the sites, the only thing that seems to change is hemlock. I mean, everything else adjusts, <laughs> but it's not as if something else suddenly shows up on the scene and takes over. Um, it, everything, like everything else accommodates that percentage effect, but it's not, um, but it really it seems to be hemlock changing on its own. There are places, though, uh, one of our sites on Cape Cod, I didn't talk about, is really fascinating because at the same time that hemlock declines, oak also crashes. And, um, and it's replaced by beach, um, uh, American beach. And, and our interpretation of that is that Cape Cod is this peninsula sticking out in the ocean. And we, our temperature estimates actually come from green ocean cores. And so we know that the ocean temperatures drop, and so this effect might be particularly pronounced on the coast, and that oak being a warm, loving species would have been more sensitive to that than the beach, which we tolerate. So what's sugar maple doing during yeah. all of this? Sugar maple, um, it kind of rides it out, but on our coastal sites, it actually does increase some. Um, um, so there is a transition in our coastal sites where you get more of a kind of cooler type deciduous forest, so um, maple comes in. I really, I'm actually really interested to pursue the history of maple, um, sugar maple, because that's it is a species we can isolate individually in the pollen grains. And so it'd be another one, but I, I didn't show you, but I've actually done the same modeling exercise for the other species, and, and it, all, it actually does at least as well as other species. Um, but, but, uh, but maple would be kind of an interesting one. Thanks. Yeah. So on the pitchstone plateau, that are like yeah. ribbon forests, so you're familiar with those. And it, it looks like, I'm not arguing in any way, but I'm just asking, uh, it looks like they are on rockier ridges than the intermediate. Yeah. Uh, it, but that could be accentuated by drifts, especially if there were a lot of less deposited in those intermediate areas, too. So the way, the way I've been thinking about that is that there's a, potentially in a lot of these places, a geomorphic template. Um, and so uh, in this case, the pollen data suggests that that landscape had been more thoroughly vegetated or forested. Um, but then if you have a template that already either facilitates oh, oh, drifting oh. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, to occur or favors the trees better on certain parts of that landscape than others, then when, once this transition takes place, then that, those are going to be the microsites where you get the trees. So, um, so I, yeah, so I, I don't, but I've, I've wondered about this. Um, it would be interesting to go look at some of these areas, like near one of our sites, to see topographically, you know, are there little bedrock ridges that these trees mm -hmm. are on, and do those extend into areas that are fully forested, suggesting that you can have both states on that landscape, mm -hmm. um, but it's just that the interaction of climate and fire opened it up more um, at Certain, in certain areas where, where it burned, so, and where, where the drifting occurred. So do you see tree rings, and are they of interest? You know, I, I feel like they are, are strongly related. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It would be, I mean, it would be really interesting to look at the tree rings <laughs> from some of these uh, forests. Uh, that's not something we've done in, in this case, but, uh, but we could learn a lot from doing that, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So I've been fascinated with William Rudiman and this yeah, whole idea yeah, of huh? anthropogenic drivers. Yep. Have you thought about that? And yeah, um, so uh, uh, in New England, actually, we're working really closely with the UMass Amherst Archaeology Group uh, to summarize the human history on the same landscape where we're looking at hemlock uh, to see what, what human activities uh, are playing out. And so far, so we, what we've done there is contrast areas where they're culturally distinct areas on the coast versus inland. And hemlock does the same thing in both areas, but other species do different things. And uh, and one of our biggest questions was what what role did fire play in this? And and interestingly, uh, at the sites where we've counted charcoal, there are not big fire events at the time of the hemlock decline. And the frequency of fire or the amount of charcoal in the cores is not obviously related to the cultural history. So um, so that whatever that human influence is on landscape, which I'm sure is there. It's not jumping out yet, or really apparent. Uh, it'll be interesting to see. I mean, um, the Redmond hypothesis is really fascinating in terms of the potential implications for atmospheric 
composition. We'll see how that continues to play out. But at least in these areas, we don't have a really obvious human signal. Vitamins coming in the fall is our distinguished what? business nice. speaker. Yeah, awesome. Uh, so you kind of lay this out as these two these two ways of explaining vegetation change, external and intrinsic. But I mean, they're, as they're a not geographer, mutually exclusive. Yeah, you I, sort of explained a spatial scale mm -hmm. of vegetation response in, on the order of papers that you and Jeff Williams have done mm -hmm. and things like that, right? Where at the large scale, it's climate, yeah. and then as you get small, finer and finer, it's going to be more intrinsic, right? Yeah, yeah, no, that's right. I mean, I think. Um, well, what surprised me in the ribbon forest case, which was, that's where we really came down in scale, to a single landscape anyway. Um, what surprised me there was that the ox and isotope data were still the first order explanation of changes in pollen trends. And so while there's an effect of the fires, it seems, that's actually in the residual. So, it's the, so the first order is the climate, and the second order is this disturbance. Now, if we were able to come down even smaller in scale, then I would think, I mean, obviously, if you're in the fire burns to right here, that area is going to be affected by the fire, and that area is not. But on the scale of the pollen source area that's flowing into that wave, um, still climate was a pretty strong factor, which I was surprised by. But, but I totally agree. Um, I don't mean to make it as it's either this or that. It's These are kind of two end members of things that are involved. And I was trying to, um, my, my goal really is to sort of say, okay, we need to look at climate as a broad factor that's influencing things, especially at the large scale. Um, and now it's interesting to zoom in and see what, what role other factors play as we come in. I mean, I'd love to do, for the hemlock, I'd like to do more landscape scale stuff and look at what disturbances are there. And we've, we've actually tried that. Um, so look for charcoal, and there's not a strong association with fire events. And we've actually gone to small hollows, so little tiny ponds where Hemlock trees are hanging totally over them. They, like the pond is smaller than this room. The canopy of the forest completely covers it. Needles, anything on those trees falls right in the mud. Um, we thought if there's ever a place we're going to find insects that have been killing these trees, that would be it. Right? And we found them. They're just not at the time of the hemlock. So, um, so the insects are affecting these forests, but they don't seem to be that explanation. But, but at the same time, something had to kill them. Right? It's not necessary. Although, I should distinguish that. Just because the percentage of hemlock goes down doesn't mean those trees were killed instantaneously. It could just mean that they died and weren't replaced. <coughs> um, so it could be a recovery issue. In which case, then the colder conditions and drier conditions could really influence uh, regeneration in a way that makes up that. We had this question about people. Yeah. So if you go to that those areas that were uh, heavily peopled, but now we believe they're totally virgin for us. Uh -huh. I'm thinking of South America. Yeah, I think, that's, that's, I'm thinking, thinking of the Mayan yeah. area. Mm -hmm. uh, is is there a potential for using your techniques to look into that? Are there lakes both places? There's got to be lakes oh, yeah. in Chile. No, there's really interesting work um, done from uh, some of those areas for sure. I mean, I, I it's interesting in Eastern North America, you see when Europeans show up because all the trees go down and you start getting weeds coming in as though mm -hmm. they clear the land. Um, in Central America, you see the opposite, where people are using that landscape, Spanish show up, disease kills off the native population, and all of a sudden places that had been open become reforested. And so those those signatures are very clear in some of these records. And, I, and um, you know, it, it's it's uh, it would be really interesting to look at how those types of influences play out against some of the climate changes. Long time scales. I think this would be an interesting question, for example, to look at in Europe because we know there's a long history of land use there. But of course, climate also changed. So, how does that? It's not that the fact that humans were using the land prevents climate from changing things or, or the other way around. So, so, there would have been some interactions there. Um, so, it would be interesting to look further into that. Ended up the plague. Yeah, exactly. That's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Brian, thanks, this is really great. Thank you.